All right, welcome to our complete cardio review for the USMLE Step 2. In this video, we're going to have 200 cardiology review questions, and we're going to be covering everything you need to know for cardiology, and yes, you will be prepared on exam day. Stay tuned, as in the next several videos, we're going to be covering all topics for the USMLE Step 2. Upon completion of this series, a review packet will be available at my website, agmonics.com, and of course, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. So let's begin. Question number one. A 37-year-old woman has left-sided chest pain that worsens with movement of the left arm. Palpation of the chest reproduces the pain, and the EKG is shown. What is the next best step, pacemaker or observation? Well, this question is actually pretty easy because it says that palpation of the chest reproduces the pain. And therefore, we know, at least for the purposes of exams, that this has nothing to do with ischemia. This has nothing to do with the heart. This pain over here is actually musculoskeletal in origin. She likely has just muscle pain. That's why palpation of the chest would reproduce the pain. In ischemia, palpation would not reproduce the pain. As far as the EKG, we see a normal EKG. Except for an incidental finding of a prolonged PR interval, this would be consistent with first degree AV block, which is generally asymptomatic. So that's what we have over here, a lady with musculoskeletal pain with an incidental finding of a first degree AV block on EKG. And this is the point, that ischemia produces a sore, squeezing, or pressure-like pain that does not change with movement, palpation, or respiration. And in fact, ischemia can effectively be ruled out if there is pain with movement, or pain with palpation, or pain with respiration, at least for the purposes of the USMLE. Question number two. Oh, we have a fun mnemonic coming up for this one, as you'll see. Here's the question. A 52-year-old woman recently started on a blood pressure medication now complains of chest tightness, pain in her elbows and knees, and erythematous plaques on her face, arms, and torso. Which medication caused this to occur? Lisinopril, furosemide, hydralazine, or verapamil? So here, we're dealing with drug-induced lupus. That's why she has pain in her elbows and knees and erythematous plaques on her face, arms, and torso. Which medication causes drug-induced lupus? Hydralazine. Besides flushing and headaches, hydralazine can cause drug-induced lupus. Lisinopril, furosemide, and verapamil have their own side effects, but they are not generally associated with drug-induced lupus. Here we have a fun mnemonic for the drugs that cause drug-induced lupus. The mnemonic is SHIP. S for sulfazalazine, H for hydralazine, I for isoniazid, P for procainamide, and P for penicillamine. And I put these loops over here around the anchor to help us remember lupus. That These are the drugs that cause drug-induced lupus, the SHIP drugs. Question number three. A 61-year-old woman with a history of chest pain presents with 10 minutes of crushing substernal chest pain radiating to the left arm. Troponin T levels are 0.4. What is the diagnosis? Stable angina, Prince Metal's angina, unstable angina, or MI? This is easy. Troponin T levels are elevated at 0.4. This is what separates MI from unstable angina, that in MI, the troponin T levels will be elevated above 0.4. We just take a look at the other choices over here. Stable angina is when there's chest pain reproducible with exertion, such as exercise. In Prince Metal's angina, there's a vasospasm of the arteries, but of course there will be no cardiac enzymes and treatment is with calcium channel blockers. And in unstable angina, there are no cardiac enzymes and treatment is similar to MI. So the answer over here is myocardial infarction because we have elevation of troponin levels above or at least at 0.4. Question number four. A 50-year-old woman recently started taking fluconazole and ondansetron. She now developed palpitations and this is her EKG. What is the proper treatment? Well, in the EKG, we see torsade de pointe. What is the treatment for that? Magnesium. Intravenous magnesium is first-line therapy for stable patients with torsade de pointe. And cardioversion is indicated if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. And here we just have a fun mnemonic for the causes of torsade de pointe. Antiarrhythmics, antibiotics, antipsychotics, spelled with a C, antidepressants, antiemetics, and antifungals. And of course, various electrolyte abnormalities such as decreased magnesium, potassium, or calcium. And symptoms of torsade de pointe include palpitations, dizziness, and syncope, which are typical, and it could even present with sudden cardiac death. And that's why we want to treat it. Question number five. A man comes to the ED with crushing chest pain for the last hour. EKG shows ST elevations in V2 through V4. And apparently the guy doesn't even have a face. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's just my picture over here in the cartoon. But anyway, we're dealing with an anterior wall myocardial infarction. So what's the next step? 
CCAM B level, oxygen, thrombolytics, or aspirin? And the answer is aspirin. We want to give aspirin as soon as possible because we're dealing with an MI. It's critical to give aspirin as soon as possible since it lowers mortality. CCAM B level, well, those levels won't be elevated until after an hour. Oxygen, that doesn't lower mortality. And thrombolytics, yes, but only after two antiplatelets, aspirin, and a second antiplatelet, such as clopidogrel. Here we just have a nice summary of the time frame of diagnostic test abnormalities. For MI, EKG, that will be abnormal immediately. The myoglobin will be elevated after about one hour and will continue for two days. CKMB, that will be elevated after five hours and will continue for two days. And troponin levels will be elevated after four hours and will continue for 10 days. Now, because troponin levels will be elevated for up to 10 days, it can't distinguish a reinfarction occurring several days after the first event. That's why CKMB level is better for reinfarction since it should be gone after about two days. Question number six. A 62 year old woman with hypertension comes to the ED with several days of chest pain and shortness of breath. Now she is unresponsive and the EKG is shown where we see ventricular fibrillation. What is the next step? Defibrillation, cardioversion, amiodarone, magnesium sulfate, or epinephrine. So here we're dealing with ventricular fibrillation and therefore we do defibrillation, not cardioversion. Cardioversion is, for example, in a hemodynamically unstable patient with tachyarrhythmias. But for ventricular fibrillation, we have to do defibrillation. Cardioversion would induce a stimulation to the QRS complex, but in ventricular fibrillation, where we don't have a QRS complex, we can't do cardioversion. We have to do defibrillation, and you can look at the other choices for what they would be used for. Question number seven. A 26-year-old athlete comes into the office for a routine checkup. EKG shows sinus bradycardia, progressive lengthening of the PR interval, followed by intermittent drop, QRS complexes. So here, we're dealing with a Mobitz type 1, second degree AV block and no ST segment abnormalities are present. So what's the next step? So basically we're asking, what do you do in Mobitz type one, second degree AV block, pacemaker or reassurance? And the answer is reassurance. Just like type one AV block, type Mobitz type one, second degree AV block is usually asymptomatic. So first degree is asymptomatic. Second degree is usually asymptomatic. Second degree by type two, presents usually with fatigue, lightheadedness, and syncope, and requires a pacemaker generally. And third degree involves fatigue, lightheadedness, syncope, and of course requires a pacemaker. Question number eight. A 46-year-old man has had frequent epigastric burning after playing basketball for the past six months. Antacids provide no relief. Blood pressure is 142 over 91. There are no heart murmurs, and the abdomen is non-tender. The EKG is normal. What's the next step? exercise EKG or H. pylori stool testing. So here we're dealing with a cardiac problem and therefore exercise EKG. And the take home over here is get an exercise stress EKG in patients with suspected stable ischemic heart disease. This brings us to our next point, angina classification, typical angina versus atypical angina. In typical or classic angina, there's substernal chest pain or discomfort that is provoked by exertion or emotional stress and relieved by rest or nitroglycerin or both. And in atypical angina, that applies when two out of the three criteria are met, such as in our example where the guy had epigastric pain instead of substernal chest pain. Question number nine, a 51 year old woman with a history of hypertension comes to the ED with chest pain and diaphoresis that has lasted for 24 hours. EKG shows ST elevations in two, three, and AVF. So we're dealing with an inferior wall MI. Three days later, she develops sudden shortness of breath and low blood pressure. So something happened. Now there are biobasilar crackles and a faint systolic murmur. What is the cause of the patient's new symptoms? Papillary muscle rupture or left ventricle free wall rupture. This presentation is most consistent with mitral regurgitation secondary to the papillary muscle rupture. That's why there's a faint systolic murmur that represents the mitral regurgitation, the acute mitral regurgitation. The bibasilar crackles represents blood being backed up into the lungs. So again, we're dealing with papillary muscle rupture leading to mitral regurgitation. If we take a look at this chart over here, we see the time frame of the various post-MI complications. We see papillary muscle rupture occurs acutely or within three to five days, whereas free wall rupture occurs within five days or up to two weeks. So the time frame is not really going to give it away. What's going to give it away is the presentation. Now, if you look at the coronary artery involved, in papillary muscle rupture, that involves the RCA, whereas in free wall rupture, it involves the LAD. So in our situation, where we're dealing with an inferior wall myocardial infarction, that generally involves the RCA. That also gives it away. Now, just a little mnemonic over here is that 
Papa likes RCA computers, Papa for papillary, and RCA computers for right coronary artery. That the right coronary artery is the one involved in papillary muscle rupture, whereas free the lad, this reminds us that the LED is involved in free wall rupture post-MI complications due after a myocardial infarction. Question number 10. A 53-year-old woman is evaluated five days after an MI involving the LAD. She's, so again, LAD, that reminds us, free the lad, free wall rupture. Let's see if we get this right. She suddenly develops chest pain and EKG shows heart rate of 140 a minute. She soon becomes unresponsive. What is the diagnosis? So again, LAD, free wall rupture, and this sudden, pre, this sudden onset decompensation is consistent with free wall rupture. In IV septum rupture, it's unlikely to cause such a rapid progression to pulselessness. Question 11. What is the pathophysiology of an S4 sound? ATP depletion or increased elasticity? And the answer is ATD, de, ATP depletion. And the explanation is like this. Myocardial relaxation, i.e. diastole, is an ATP-dependent process. Therefore, ischemia of the myocardium would cause the left ventricular walls to become stiff and unable to relax. Therefore, during atrial contraction, blood strikes against the stiffened left ventricular wall and creates the fourth heart sound. Here we just have a chart of features of S4 and S3. Again, S4 is caused by blood hitting a, le a stiff left ventricular wall during atrial contraction, whereas S3 is caused by blood filling an enlarged left ventricular cavity during passive diastolic filling. Question 12, the most common cause of isolated aortic stenosis in elderly patients is, so why do elderly patients get aortic stenosis? Age-related calcific changes. Question 13, a one-hour-old baby is evaluated for respiratory distress with 95% oxygen on room air. The mother had poorly controlled gestational diabetes. Echo shows a small left ventricular cavity and increased IV septum thickness. What is the next best step, beta blocker or surgery? So here we're dealing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of infancy, and that's beta blocker therapy. We give beta blockers in order to treat the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a potential neonatal complication of maternal diabetes, usually when it's poorly controlled, and it's caused by increased glycogen and fat deposition in myocardial cells, and we give beta blocker therapy. Normally, this actually self-resolves within a year, but in the meantime, we give beta blocker therapy. Question 14. A 54-year-old woman with a recent URI comes in with worsening exertional dyspnea for several days, low blood pressure, 86 over 59, pulse is 109, and JVD is 11 centimeters, lungs are clear and heart sounds are muffled. What is the cause of the patient's presentation? So this patient over here has Beck's triad. We have low blood pressure, we have a JVD, an elevated JVD, and we also have muffled heart sounds. That's that's tamponade, cardiac tamponade. So what's the cause of the symptoms in tamponade? So there's going to be decreased left ventricular preload. Since the heart is being squashed, there will be a reduced preload and therefore cardiac output will be decreased. It's not A, there's actually going to be an increased cardiac contractility in cardiac tamponade as a compensatory mechanism. Question 15, a 28 year old woman at 25 weeks gestation comes in with a blood pressure of 153 over 89. Physical exam of mom is normal and the baby's heart rate is 150 a minute on Doppler. Liver function studies are normal. Normal, what is the next step? So here we have nuanced hypertension in the pregnant lady. And because of the potential complications associated with preeclampsia, for example, maternal end organ damage and fetal growth restriction, all patients with a hypertension at above 20 weeks gestation would require preeclampsia evaluation. And that would clue, include a collection for total protein. So that's what we do over here, collection for total protein. Magnesium sulfate is for preeclampsia when we already know it's severe. And of course, we don't do reassurance because we need to evaluate this lady. Question 16, correcting which of the following CAD risk factors will benefit the patient the most? And the answer is actually smoking. Smoking cessation results in the greatest immediate improvement in, in patient outcomes for CAD. And already within one year after smoking, the risk of CAD decreases by 50%. And after two years, by 90%. Question 17, according to current guidelines, who does not require statin therapy? A patient with a history of stroke, a patient with a history of stable angina, a patient with an LDL greater than 190, a diabetic older than 40, or a patient with an ACS CVD 10 year risk of 5%? And the answer is, all of these require statin therapy, except E, because actually it must be at least 7.5% to 10%. 5% 10 year risk would not be enough. But again, A, B, C, D are all true. They all require statin therapy. 
Question 18, what is the most common cause of stent thrombosis, where we have a thrombosis in a previously placed stent? And the answer is medication non-compliance. That's why it's so important when putting in a stent to make sure that the patient complies with their medication. Stent thrombosis has very high morbidity and mortality, and therefore patients should be screened and making sure that they take their medications. Question 19. A 45-year-old woman from Africa presents with exertional dyspnea and early diastolic sound, that is an opening snap, followed by a rumbling diastolic murmur. Which of the following is expect to be seen upon measuring the left ventricular diastolic pressure, increased or normal pressure? So over here, the progressive exertional dyspnea in a patient from Africa, as well as the opening snap, all point to the direction of mitral stenosis. In the U.S., it's most frequently seen in patients who emigrated from Latin America, Africa, or Asia, and this patient over here is from Africa. What happens over here in mitral stenosis is that there's a stenotic valve which doesn't allow for proper left ventricular filling. That's why there's an early diastolic sound and a diastolic murmur, because as it tries to fill the left ventricle, it pushes through the stenotic valve. And over here, there's going to be actually normal pressure in the left ventricle because the the obstruction over here is above the left ventricle, but in the left ventricle itself, there will be normal pressure. Question 20. A 74-year-old woman presents to her family doctor with lower face puffiness, but no other complaints. Her medications include aspirin, sacubitril, valsartan, furosemide, anastatin, creatinine, and electrolyte levels are normal. What is the next step? So she has puffiness. Hmm, what's going on with this puffiness over here? This is actually a medical emergency, and the reason is because we're dealing with angioedema. P patients with angioedema, this is an adverse side effect of sacubitril valsartan, an angiotensin receptor neprilocin inhibitor, which is used to treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but since it could produce angioedema, which is a medical emergency, she should go to the emergency room. Angioedema is an adverse effect, again, of sacubitril valsartan. Question 21. A 56-year-old man with pleuritic chest pain presents three days after MI. Lungs are clear bilaterally. EKG shows tachycardia and diffuse PR segment depression. What is the next best step? So here, we're not dealing with Dressler syndrome. That usually occurs several weeks after MI. But we're dealing with a pericarditis. And therefore, this is peri-infarction pericarditis, which actually occurs a few days, can occur a few days after an MI. That's why we have the tachycardia and diffuse PR segment depressions. So the next best step over here would be echocardiogram. Echocardiogram allows us to rule out other things, such as a left ventricular free wall rupture. So again, in peri-infarction pericarditis, we have to get an echo to assess for the pericardial effusion, and again, to rule out any other lesions, such as a left ventricular free wall rupture. Question 22. A three-day-old girl is evaluated for poor feeding and fussiness. Blood pressure is 65 over 40 in the right upper arm and 39 over 27 in the right lower leg. This makes us think of coarctation of the aorta. That's why there's such a difference between the upper and lower extremity blood pressure. That because the upper extremity is being perfused, but not the lower one. What is the next best step? Epinephrine or prostaglandin? And the answer is, in coarctation of the aorta, we want to give prostaglandin E1 in order to maintain patency of the ductus arteriosus. Maintaining patency of the ductus arteriosus will allow for better perfusion and will also reduce afterload on the left ventricle. It maintains patency of the ductus arteriosus. That's prostaglandin E1. We could say it makes the baby glad. Question 23. A 10-hour-old baby is evaluated in the nursery. Pulse ox is 99%. The baby's trunk is pink, but hand and feet are cyanotic. There's a low-pitched 2 out of 6 mid-systolic ejection murmur heard at the upper left sternal border. Pulses are symmetric and normal. What is the next best step? And the answer is reassurance. Murmurs are common in newborns and are often due to turbulent blood flow. We know that it's innocent when it's soft in intensity and it's earlier mid-systolic as opposed to hollow systolic. Question 24. A 76-year-old man with no complaints of cardiac or respiratory symptoms is evaluated for a heart murmur. Echo shows severe aortic stenosis with an EF 45% with a valid area of 1 cubic centimeter. What is the next best step? Recommend surgery or reassurance and follow-up? And the answer over here is recommend surgery. If there's left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 50%, we want to recommend surgery. Uh, another indication would be symptoms, and another would be if the patient is undergoing another cardiac surgery. Question 25. A 51-year-old woman without cardiac symptoms is evaluated for heart murmurs. Echo show MR, mitral regurgitation, with an EF of 51%. Is that bad? 
Well, normally EF of 51% is not so bad, but in mitral regurgitation, an EF of 51% is really bad because we're measuring how much blood is ejected from the left ventricle. And in mitral regurgitation, some of the blood is ejected through the aorta and some is through the left atrium. And therefore, 51% is really bad. We want it to be higher than that. So the next best step would be surgery. MR with an EF of 30 to 60% is really bad. The regurgitant flow accounts for a large amount of the stroke volume. If it's less than 30%, it's really, really, really bad. And I'm not even sure that surgery would be something indicated the patient has probably gotten too far. Question 26. A one-month-old baby is brought in for a well visit. The baby is breathing well and is not cyanotic. A three out of six hollow systolic murmur and thrill are present at the left lower sternal border. So that's a ventricular septal defect. Chest x-ray shows an enlarged left side of the heart. Well, that makes sense. The ventricular septal defect in, in the blood flows from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, and that goes to up to the lungs, and that increases preload of the left atrium. So what is the pathophysiology of this finding? Left atrial preload increase. Again, as I mentioned, blood flows from the left ventricle to the right ventricle to the left atrium, increasing the left side of the heart. So this increased left atrial preload. Question 27, the most common cause of constrictive pericarditis in developing countries is tuberculosis. That's the most common cause of constrictive pericarditis in developing countries. Constrictive pericarditis is a condition marked by pericardial fibrosis and obliteration of the pericardial space, which impairs ventricular filling during diastole. Uh, I wrote that over here. And this, the patient will have symptoms of fatigue and dyspnea on exertion and signs of volume overload. Which imaging is used to confirm a diagnosis of aortic dissection in a distressed hypotensive patient? And the answer is transesophageal echo, an echocardiogram. Ascending aortic dissection is emergency surgical repair, imaging with TEE, transesophageal echo, or CT angiography in non-hypotensive patients first confirms the diagnosis and helps, diagnose, helps guide the surgery. Question 29. What is the most common cause of acute cardiac arrest subsequent to an MI? And the answer is ventricular fibrillation. That's why it's so important to control a person's rate after an MI. Question 30. Which of the following women, women can get pregnant? Of all these choices, only see a woman with a heart failure with left ventricular ejection fraction of 50%. It has to be less than 30 to be a contraindication. But if it's 50, then it's not necessarily a contraindication. But the other women cannot get pregnant generally. A woman with symptomatic mitral stenosis, a woman with symptomatic aortic stenosis, and a woman with pulmonary arterial, arterial hypertension. I just thought of a mnemonic for this right now. MAP. Mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, and pulmonary arterial hypertension, MAP. Question 31. A new diastolic murmur is heard along the left sternal border in a patient several years after aortic valve replacement. What is the next best step? So it's a diastolic murmur. So here we're dealing with aortic regurgitation, and therefore we got an echo. We need to assess for the aortic regurgitation, a common complication, or a relatively common, after aortic valve replacement. Question 32. A patient who hasn't seen a physician in years presents the ED with pressure-like chest pain. Blood pressure is pretty high, 175 over 99. EKG looks normal. 25 minutes later, the patient is evaluated and reports the same chest pain. So what do we do now? Repeat EKG. All right, question 33. A healthy-looking, asymptomatic newborn is being evaluated. Blood pressure is 81 over 53, and a 2 out of 6 hollow systolic murmur is heard at the left lower sternal border. So here, again, we have a ventricular septal defect. What is the next best step? Reassurance and follow-up, or echo. So here, this is actually a concerning ventricular septal defect because it's a quiet one. Ventric small ventricular septal defects typically have a loud, turbulent sound. The moderate to large ones have a soft sound as a large amount of blood flows from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. And over here, since it's a large one or a concern for a large one, we want to get an echocardiogram. We want to assess the size of the ventricular septal defect and assess the risk for progression to heart failure. Question 34. The most significant controllable risk factor for stroke is blood pressure reduction Hypertension is the most important controllable risk factor for stroke. 35. A patient with a syphilis chancre of left untreated can most likely develop which of the following? So which of the following is associated with syphilis progression? And the answer is ascending aortic aneurysm, because if left untreated, the patient may develop tertiary syphilis, which is a feature is disruption of the base of or the aorta, 
often involving dilation of the aortic root or the ascending aorta. This results in an aneurysm and can lead to ascending aortic aneurysm, which is a surgical emergency. And we can see that mitral valve stenosis is seen in late rheumatic heart disease. Endocarditis is not due to syphilis, and free wall rupture is associated with MI. It's seen 4 to 10 days after an MI. Question 36. A 5-year-old boy who fainted is evaluated. The EKG is shown. What medication should be given? So I know it's hard to see over here, but there's a long QT syndrome. So the patient likely has congenital long key syndrome, which is a disease that results from genetically impaired function of the voltage gate potassium channels. So here we give propranolol. Propranolol is given for congenital long QT syndrome. Sotolol, which is another beta blocker, is actually contraindicated in, in long QT syndrome due to its effects on potassium channels. And quinidine is also contraindicated in long QT syndrome. It exacerbates the disease. But propranolol is good because it shortens the QRS. It shortens the QT. 37. A patient with angina is provided a daily medication to help prevent episodes of angina. What is the mechanism of the medication? So here we're dealing with some type of daily medication to prevent angina, and that decreases myocardial contractility. Beta blockers are first line and then calcium channel blockers. The way beta blockers work is by reducing myocardial oxygen demand through a decrease in heart rate and myocardial contractility, and they are highly effective in minimizing or eliminating exertional angina. Calcium channel blockers do basically the same thing but and are given as second line. So therefore, the answer is decreased myocardial contractility. And we have a uh, chronic stable angina treatment, beta blockers, the calcium channel blockers, the two types, nitrates, which ha work through a de de decreased preload through dilation of veins, and renolazine. Question 38. A systolic murmur at the apex of the heart that disappears when squatting, well, squatting increases venous return. So there will be increased left ventricular volume, and that helps the mitral valve prolapse murmur get quieter, shorter, and may even disappear, as opposed to a ventricular septal defect. Well, we could already know that it's not that because we know that the systolic murmur is heard best at the apex, whereas a ventricular septal defect will be heard best at the left lower sternal, or bo sternal border. And also, squatting is going to increase left ventricular volume, which would probably make the ventricular septal defect murmur get louder. Question 39. A 36-year-old female presents with a hollow systolic murmur that is loudest at the apex. She complains of palpitations. What is the cause of her condition? So here, there's a hollow systolic murmur. What is this? This is going to be mitral regurgitation, and therefore we're dealing with degeneration of the mitral valve. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common cause of chronic mitral regurgitation, at least in developed countries. And what happens is in mitral valve prolapse is that there's a myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve leaflets and chordae tendinae, which causes a mid-systolic click followed by a mid-to-late systolic murmur. So over here, we're dealing with degeneration of the mitral valve leading to mitral regurgitation. Question 40. A 24-year-old woman presents the ED due to intermittent dizziness and weakness for several days. She has no significant medical history and physical exam is otherwise normal. EKG is shown below where we see a fib. Echo shows no structural abnormalities. So what is the appropriate test to be ordered? CT angiogram or serum TSH level? So here we're dealing with a woman who has AFib with no significant medical history, and she has dizziness and weakness. We want to start thinking about hyperthyroidism, and therefore we want a serum TSH as well as T4. T4 levels. And so I wrote over here, hyperthyroidism can increase atrial conduction automaticity and leading to atrial fibrillation. The AFib can be asymptomatic or may present with symptoms such as in this lady where we see dizziness and, and weakness. Question 41. Symptomatic bradycardia is treated with? How do we treat bradycardia that produces symptoms? The answer is atropine. Atropine blocks the parasympathetic innervation to the heart, thus speeding up the heart. So we want to treat a symptomatic patient with bradycardia with atropine. And for asymptomatic bradycardia, we generally leave that alone. In terms of the other drugs, adenosine would be for something like AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and amiodarone for tachyarrhythmias that are hemodynamically stable. And you could take a look at the other choices. Question 42. A 36-year-old male comes to the office and it's discovered on EKG that it has premature atrial complexes, PACs. He drinks two cups of coffee a day. He has no chest pain or cardiac symptoms. His father died in MI at 65. What's the next best step? So the answer is, well, let's see the choices. Halter monitoring? That's for rhythm. Should he smoke marijuana? Probably not. Rather, he should avoid caffeine. And I have a fun mnemonic over here for PACs. Please avoid caffeine and smoking. That's basically the treatment of PACs to avoid 
instigating factors such as caffeine and smoking, and the person should as well try to avoid stress, extra stress. Question 43. High dose niacin therapy, for example, to treat lipid abnormalities, often produces what side effect? Cutaneous flushing and itching. All right. So that's high dose niacin therapy. Keep that side effect in mind. And I put a note over here. Niacin is the most effective lipid modifying drug for rating, raising HDL levels. It reduces triglycerides and VLDLs and LDL synthesis primarily by reducing fatty acid mobilization in fatty acid tissue. Flushing and itching can occur due to vasodilation. A nice summary of niacin. Question 44. Aortic stenosis with a valve area of 2.5 generally leads to exertional chest discomfort and shortness of breath. The answer is no. It generally does not produce symptoms until it's less than one cubic centimeters. And just to remember, the normal size of the aortic valve is three to four cubic centimeters, but 2.5 would not produce symptoms generally. Question 45. A woman develops progressive dyspnea, non-productive cough, and bilateral inspiratory crackles. What medication caused this to happen? Which of these medication leads to lung fibrosis? And the answer is amiodarone. Amiodarone leads to lots of bad things amongst them. Lung fibrosis, also AV block, and hypotension. And you could take a look at the other choices to see what side effects they produce. 46. Which of the following medications elevates blood pressure in about 5% of patients? Which one would elevate blood pressure? Oral contraceptives or prazosin? The answer is oral, oral contraceptives. They could produce a mild elevation in blood pressure in lots of patients, but to produce overt hypertension, that's actually fairly common. It, ha it happens in some patients, and therefore they should switch to a different medication. Prazosin, of course, would not lead to an elevation of blood pressure. Prazosin is an alpha blocker, it would lead to a decrease in blood pressure. It's used to treat hypertension, and it could lead to, um, and it's, also, it's also used to treat BPH, post-traumatic stress, stress, stress syndrome nightmares, and renowned phenomenon. That's what prazosin is used for, but it definitely does not elevate blood pressure. It's used to treat high blood pressure in some cases. Question 46. An infant with hemodynamically insta hemodynamic instability who underwent cardiac surgery now develops tachycardia, tachypnea, distant heart sounds, and enlargement of the cardiac silhouette on CXR, chest x-ray. What is the diagnosis? That for sure sounds like a pericardial effusion. Now there's fluid around the heart, and that's why he has distant heart sounds and tachycardia, and the enlargement of the cardiac silhouette represents fluid filling up the area around the heart. And we have Bex Triad over here, hypotension, distended neck veins, and muffled heart sounds. Question 48. A few days after a viral infection, a 45-year-old male develops a low-grade fever, substantial chest pain that worsens with deep breathing, so we already want to start thinking about viral pericarditis, and a scratchy triphasic sound on auscultation. That is an uh, indication that we're dealing with virus, viral pericarditis. That's that friction rub. What is the first line treatment? And the answer over here is ibuprofen and colchicin. Colchis ibuprofen and colchicin are used in the treatment of viral pericarditis. Just remind ourselves which viruses cause viral pericarditis. For example, adenovirus, Coxsackie virus, Echovirus, influenza virus, and HIV can all cause viral pericarditis, amongst others. All right, and I wrote over here what the other drugs are used for. For example, heparin for acute coronary syndrome, and you could take a look at the other choices. Question 49. A hemodynamically stable patient with a high blood pressure, 170 over 100, has an EKG shown blown. What's the next best step? So here we see a lack of P waves, and we see this uh, irregular irregularly irregular rhythm. So we're dealing with AFib. So what do we do to treat AFib? So we want to give diltiazem, diltiazem or a beta blocker, such as metoprolol, and the goal rate should be less than 110 over a minute. So we give, again, a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker to treat this hemodynamically stable patient. If we had hemodynamic instability, we would do cardioversion. Question 50. A newborn presents with micronathia, microcephaly, and rocker bottom feet. What cardio de cardiac defect does he likely have? So here we're dealing with Edwards syndrome. That explains these symptoms. And in Edwards syndrome, we see ventricular septal defect. Again, Edwards syndrome is trisomy 18. And we see uh, ve ventricular septal defect is common in these patients. Question 51. A pregnant lady dyspnea, orthopnea, and new AFib. This is a terrible question, but I'll explain what's going on over here. We're dealing with rheumatic mitral stenosis. So, that, so we're dealing with symptoms consistent with pulmonary edema with rapid decompression due to development of new AFib with rapid ventricular response. And so we, we have over here, she likely had some sort of history of uh, uh, rheumatic, fe rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, and that's why she develops mitral stenosis. And the AFib worsens the pulmonary edema, and that's what's going on over here. I'm sorry for this awful question. Question, oh, yeah, I wrote that over here. 
the uh, the AFib worsens the diastolic filling time, further increasing left atrial pressure, worsening the pulmonary, pulmonary edema. Once again, a pretty poor question, which you might get used to as you'll see some pretty poor questions on test day. Question 52. Once malignant pericardial effusions are managed, so we're here doing with malignant pericardial effusions. So we managed it with pericardiocentesis. How are they prevented in the future from recurrence? Pericardial window. We do that to prevent recurrence, not prednisone. Prednisone would not be the initial therapy. That would, we require prolonged drainage. Rather, we pro, uh, uh, put in a pericardial window, which is surgical removal of part of the pericardium to allow fluid to drain into the pleural or peritoneal cavity. And an alternative to the window would be a prolonged pericardial catheter drain. Question 52, what is the statin's mechanism of action? Enzyme blockage or inhibition of intracellular synthesis pathway? Well, you know statins are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, and that's why they block intracellular synthesis pathway. They block the synthesis of cholesterol. Yeah, they, that's required. HMG-CoA reductase is required for cholesterol synthesis, and they inhibit that. 54. Sinus sick syndrome is most commonly caused by degeneration of the sinus node. That's what the most common cause of sinus sick syndrome is. Um, it's also known as sinus node dysfunction. The disease is called that, and the SA node can't generate an adequate heart rate. Question 55. An otherwise healthy-looking newborn has cyanosis. Oxygen saturation is 75% on room air, as well as after pure oxygen is delivered. No strider or murmurs are heard. What's the diagnosis? Vascular rings or transmission of the great arteries? Well, both of these conditions would produce cyanosis, and both of these would produce a low oxygen saturation even after pure oxygen is delivered because they're not primary pulmonary disorders. Only in primary pulmonary disorders does oxygen saturation, well, at least in primary pulmonary disorders, would oxygen delivery help. These are structural problems of the heart and the vessels, and therefore oxygen sat delivery is not going to help. And therefore, what's the answer? The answer is transposition of the great arteries. And the, an and the reason is because in vascular rings, we would hear strider. We would hear a sound. As opposed to in transposition of the great arteries, there would be no striders or murmurs. What happens in transposition of the great arteries? The aorta comes from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery from the left ventricle. And of course, we have to uh, perform surgery on that baby. Question 56. A 56-year-old man presents with pain, pallor, paresthesias, pulses, poikilothermia in the right leg. What is the next step? So here we're dealing with acute limb ischemia. And therefore, we provide IV heparin. IV heparin is given to all patients diagnosed via clinical exam. We give heparin, IV heparin, or some form of anticoagulation. For some patients, this improves symptoms. For others, percutaneous thrombolysis, stresses out place, or thrombectomy is required. So again, this is the classic presentation of acute limb ischemia, all these Ps. Pain, pallor, paresthesias, pulsiveness, and poikilothermia. All right, question 57. What post-MI complication typically occurs three to five days after an MI and presents with sudden onset cardiogenic shock with hypertension and a new harsh hollow-systolic murmur with a palpal throughout the left sternal border? So we're dealing with a post-MI complication that has a murmur that sounds kind of like a ventricular septal defect, and this would be rupture of the IV septum. It kind of like makes a ventricular septal defect, and therefore it would have the same murmur. That's why I wrote over here, typically occurs three to five days after the MI, presents with sudden onset cardiogenic shock with hypotension and new harsh ventricular septal defect like diastolic, uh, uh, systolic murmur. Papillary muscle rupture leads to an acute severe MR along with hypotension, but the systolic murmur of the MR is soft with no palpable thrill. Question 58. Patients with Wolf, Parkinson, White who develop AFib should be treated with procainamide. Procainamide is the treatment for Wolf, Parkinson, White syndrome uh, AFib. Calcium channel blockers and digoxin should not be given. All right. And I wrote over here, electrocardioversion if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. And AFib occurs in 20% of patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and is a potentially life-threatening emergency. Question 59. A patient with PAD will most likely develop which of the following over the next several years? MI or amputation? The answer is MI. Amputation is pretty rare. But in MI, what happens is PAD, peripheral artery disease, is a strong indicator, a predictor of future risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, about 20%. Question 60. A patient, who who presents to the AD, a patient presents to the ED with chest pain and suspected acute coronary syndrome, for example, retrosternal chest pain, diaparesis, nausea, and or vomiting, he should be given what as soon as possible? We already know this. This is aspirin. Patients should be given aspirin as soon as possible. Aspirin inhibits thromboxane A2 to produce significant antiplatelet effects, and therefore it should be given as soon as possible. Heparin should only be given if positive cardiac markers or, for example, in pulmonary embolism. 
Question 61. Infants of diabetic mothers who develop transient hypertrotic cardiopathy should be treated with, we already know this, this is propanol. Babies to buy diabetic mothers who produce hypertrophic cardiopathy should be treated with propanolol. We did this one. We already know this. Um, it reduces the left ventricular outflow obstruction by increasing left ventricular diastolic filling time and end diastolic volume due to decreased heart rate. Question 62. What value of the ABI supports a diagnosis of PAD? I accidentally wrote PAD, diagnosis of PAD, twice over here, but the answer is less than 0.9. More than 1.3 would suggest calcified and uncompressible vessels. Question 63. A person running a barbecue develops symptoms of MI. Cardiac troponin levels are elevated. Cath shows no acute occlusion of the coronary artery. What is the next step? So we know we're not dealing with a, an acute coronary syndrome. Therefore, we're dealing with, over here, carbon monoxide poisoning, and that's why we want to get the carbon monoxide level, because carbon monoxide poisoning can actually lead to an acute MI in 30% of cases, and of course the treatment is 100% oxygen. Question 64, a patient with new intermittent claudication should be given aspirin, lipid lowering therapy, as well as recommendation for exercise. Scheduled exercise is really important for, the, for a patient with peripheral artery disease. We recommend at least 30 minutes three times a week for a minimum of 12 weeks, and this improves outcomes tremendously. Question 65, which of the following post-MI complications occurs several months after an MI? So we're dealing with several months later. The answer is left ventricular aneurysm. The other ones occur soon after the MI, not several months later. What I mean by soon is several days. Left ventricular aneurysm occurs months later. Question 66, acute severe chest pain in a woman with short stature and primary amenorrhea. So we're dealing with Turner syndrome. This should raise concern for which of the following is associated with Turner syndrome? Aortic dissection. In aortic dissection we see, is seen in patients with Turner syndrome. It's a genetic condition caused by partial or complete loss of X, the X chromosome, and that's why she has short, short stature because the X is associated with growth in females. Patients have webbed necks, gonadal dysgenesis, dysgenesis, primary ovarian insufficiency, broad chest, micronathia, scoliosis, aortic dissection, or coarctation. Turner syndrome patients should get regular screening for echo with an echo or MRI to assess for these cardiac defects. Que question 67. A 58-year-old male undergoes a cardiac cap procedure and several hours later develops back pain and a blood pressure of 76 over 59. Heart sounds are normal. Chest is cleared. Auscultation. Neck veins are flat. A leader of normal saline improved symptoms with a slight improvement in blood pressure. What's the next step? So here we're dealing with a guy who got a cardiac cath procedure and now has low blood pressure. We're likely dealing with a retroperitoneal hematoma and therefore we want to get a cath scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Cardiac cath can lead to retroperitoneal hematoma due to bleeding flow from the access, arterial access site. We want to confirm the diagnosis with a CAT scan or ultrasound, and it's often seen in those on anticoagulation. They suddenly develop hypotension and tachycardia. Treatment is usually supportive. Question 68. Caution during elective surgery for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy involves we want to give adequate hydration because this patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have left ventricular outs flow obstruction that can potentially severely limit cardiac output, so we don't want a low left ventricular blood volume. We want a high one, and that's needed throughout the cardiac cycle, even during surgery. Question 69. Which antihypertensive medication is first line in patients with CKD? The answer is ACEs and ARBs. ACEs and ARBs are nephroprotective. We want to give them to patients with CKD. Diuretics are really not good for CKD. They dry out the kidneys. All right, and just as a point over here, just to remember, there's nothing to, to do with this question, is that methyl dopa is used in pregnancy, as well as libidol and hydralazine, and in BPH, we use diuretics and alpha blockers. Question 70, a dehydrated 27-year-old woman is brought to the ED due to confusion. Her blood pressure is 81 over 32. EKG shows no P waves and a sine wave pattern. Sine wave pattern makes us think of hyperkalemia. And since we see EKG changes, what we want to give is calcium gluconate. We give calcium gluconate in in hyperkalemia, where we see changes on the EKG. We wrote over here, causes of hyperkalemia, when potassium is above five, it could be caused spuriously by drugs, renal insufficiency, cell lysis, tumor lysis syndrome, or certain foods, such as fruits. So these are causes of hyperkalemia, and we always give calcium gluconate to protect the cardiac cell membrane if the potassium is above 6.5, or if we see EKG changes. And here is just hyperkalemia treatment is calcium, calcium gluconate, beta agonists such as albuterol that gets potassium into the cells, as well as insulin and glucose, and kx which is falling out of favor due to its side effects. Question 71. In hypovolemic shock, SVR is going to be increased or decreased? It's going to be increased. 
because we want to compensate for the low cardiac output. Question 72, a systolic murmur at the lower sternal border that increases with inspiration, is that mitral or tricuspid regurgitation? So th both, both of these are systolic murmurs. We have regurgitation occurring from the ventricles to the atria. But which one is going to increase with inspiration? So the rule is that right-sided murmurs increase with inspiration, whereas left ones increase with expiration. So here we're dealing with tricuspid regurgitation, a left-sided murmur that's going to increase in inspiration. And that the reason is because it, the increased venous return to the heart will increase the murmur. Mitral regurgitation murmur would increase with expiration. All right, and we just have a chart over here from first aid of the different murmurs, and you can take a look at this. Question 73. A 37-year-old woman with a history of fevers and weight loss presents to the ED with acute onset left side of weakness. Brain imaging shows several small infarcts in the, in the parts of the right lobes. Echo shows a mass in the left atrium. What is the diagnosis? So over here, we're dealing with a tumor. This is a myxoma. It's a benign tumor. And we're over here, the most common primary cardiac neoplasm, 80% derived from the left atrium, fragments of the myxoma can embolize, leading to stroke or limb ischemia. Murmurs mimic mitral stenosis, diagnosis with echo, and treatment is with prompt surgical resection of the myxoma. All right. Question 74. A patient with a history of tetralogy of flow has a, de a decrescendo diastolic murmur heard at the left sternal border. The murmur increases with inspiration. What is the diagnosis? So a murmur over here, a decrescendo diastolic murmur would be pulmonic regurgitation, a common complication of tetralogy of fallot repair. And it's going to increase with inspiration because it's a right-sided murmur. We said that right-sided murmurs increase venous return and therefore there will be an increase with inspiration. Question 75. A patient presents with suspected prosthetic valve endocarditis. Broad spectrum antibiotics are started after cultures grow. Versa, transthoracic echo shows no abnormalities in the valves. What's the next step? So transthoracic echo in infective endocarditis is not really reliable. We want to give transesophageal echo. Transthoracic, again, it only detects PVE. Prosthetic valve endocarditis is less than 60% of the time. That's what we want to get. We want to get TEE, transesophageal echo. Question 76. Besides exercise, smoking cessation, and blood pressure control, what should be done for PAD? And the answer is take aspirin and atovastatin. Aspirin and atovastatin are indicated in PAD. Question 77. A six-year-old boy has a murmur that looks like this. What is the diagnosis? So this, of course, is a patent ductus arteriosus, a continuous murmur. A continuous murmur with maximal intensity at S2. It's due to the turbulent flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. It's best heard of the left infraclavicular or posterior interscapular region. Question 78. How does hypo, here we have a hippo, affect the EKG? So <laughs> how does hypokalemia, when there's low potassium, such as in bananas? <laughs> anyway, how does hypokalemia affect the EKG? And the answer is U-waves and T-wave flattening. A U-wave is after the T-wave. Hypokalemia leads to, T wave, to, to U waves. Hypokalemia may be due to insulin or beta 2 agonists and these other conditions. It presents with fatigue, weakness, cramps, paresthesias. EKG may show T wave flattening and U waves, an additional wave after the T wave. Question 79. A 35 year old man presents for a routine visit. Blood pressure is 180 over 106. Bilateral, non tender, upper abdominal masses are palpated. Are palpated. I spelled that right? Yes. What is the next step? So do we want to get an ultrasound of the abdomen or urine metanephrine? So here, we're likely dealing with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And that's why we have this young guy with such high blood pressure. That's why we want to get an ultrasound of the abdomen to take a look at these masses. It's most likely autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, the most common genetic cause of CKD. It leads to cystic degeneration of the renal parenchyma, and hypertension is a common early disease manifestation, even in patients in their 30s or 40s. Extra renal complications include cerebral aneurysms, hepatic and or pancreatic cysts, colonic diverticula, and valvular abnormalities. Question 80. Medications that are, are given after an MI include beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARMS, statins, and we want to give aspirin and a P2Y12 receptor blocker dual antiplatelet therapy. All right. And this, this, in this chart over here, we just talk about what each of these things do. Each of these medications given after MI and a dual antiplatelet ther therapy prevents another MI by preventing clots from forming. Question 81, metabolic acidosis, neurologic changes such as agitation and seizures and tachycardia is seen with acute cyanide toxicity. We see uh, it, what happens is in acute cyanide toxicity, there's going to be inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, it's a side effect of nitroposide, 
because metabolism of nitric oxide releases nitric oxide, which induces the vasodilation. But the problem is there are cyanide ions leading to acute cyanide toxicity, leading to oxidative phosphorylation inhibition, and that's why the neurologic symptoms develop and possibly eventual cardiovascular collapse. A healthy two-day-old boy has acrocyanosis. What tests should be done? Just routine screening. Acrocyanosis is okay. As long as, as, long as there's uh, uh, not central cyanosis, we're okay. But acrocyanosis is fine. Therefore, pulse oximetry is one part of the routine screening. 83, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy differs from athlete's heart in that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In that condition, the left atrium is going to be enlarged. In athlete's heart, uh, the size is going to be normal. And here is just the difference between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and athlete's foot. That in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we see left atrial enlargement, bizarre EKG patterns, and abnormal left ventricular filling. And we do see a family history often. These are not present in athlete's heart. Question 85, a heart medication that acts to simulate beta-1 adrenergic receptors leads to, this is going to be, decreased left ventricular and systolic volume. Well, we're talking about dobutamine here. Dobutamine increases contractility, it increases cardiac output, and therefore decreases left ventricular and systolic volume by giving the heart a very big push. And dobutamine is a beta-2-1, beta-1 adrenergic receptor agonist. Question 85, low side ears, micronathia, cleft palate, absinthymus. This sounds like the George syndrome, and in George syndrome, we see hypocalcemia. Bilateral thigh claudication, absent femoral pulses, and this is part of a triad, which includes impotence. This is Lerich syndrome, most common in men with a predisposition for atherosclerosis, and we see impotence. And if we don't see impotence, we start looking for another diagnosis. Question 87, respiratory failure due to acute decompensated heart failure is managed with which of the following? We give non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for respiratory failure due to acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, it's also IV diuretics and vasodilators to reduce preload. Dobutamine would increase cardiac output only for patients in cardiogenic shock, not respiratory failure due to acute decompensated heart failure. Question 88. In an exaggerated fall in systemic plesh, blood pressure above 10 can be seen in cardiac tamponade, and it's also actually seen in severe asthma. This is called pulsus paradoxus. It's seen in severe asthma. All right, question 89. A patient presents with edema ascites, elevated JVP, clear lungs, and low voltage QRS complexes. These are features of constrictive pericarditis, which is the result of a thickened and often calcified pericardium that limits diastolic filling. And these are the features that we see. We see features of heart failure because the heart is not able to pump properly. All right, so constrictive pericarditis results, as we explained, from thickened and often calcified pericardium, and it limits diastolic filling manifestations similar to right-sided heart failure, and paradiadectomy is the only definitive treatment where they take out some of the pericardium. Question 90. A man develops acute limb ischemia secondary to a left atrial thrombus. This could have been best prevented with an anticoagulant, a pixaban. A pixaban is a DOAC, a direct oral anticoagulant. The other choices would not be as good, and psilocybin is for intermittent claudication. In our situation over here, we had a left atrial thrombus causing acute limb ischemia. Question 91. Aortic valve infected endocarditis causes what condition in a third of cases? Perivalvular abscess. This is a complication which causes conduction abnormalities, and we suspect it in patients with persistent bacteremia or cardiac conduction abnormalities after having aortic valve infective endocarditis, and it has an 18% mortality rate. Question 92, a man presents with pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, although the chest x-ray is normal. What is the diagnosis? And over here, pulmonary embolism. It all doesn't always show chest x-ray findings. Remember, pulmonary embolism may be... Ex chest x-ray may be normal, and for that matter, some patients are completely asymptomatic at first, even with a pulmonary embolism. Question 93. A baby with poor feeding presents with a hollow stolic murmur that is latticed at the left lower sternal border. This sounds like ventricular septal defect. And an apical diastolic rumble. Well, this is also seen in ventricular septal defect, because as blood flows from the left side of the heart to the right side through the defect, there's extra blood now in the left atrium, and this extra volume of blood throw, flows through the mitral valve during diastole. That's the apical diastolic rumble, and that's seen in ventricular septal defect. 
ventricular septal defect. And that's what we wrote over here, the increased flow across the mitral valve. Question 94, nitrates such as nitroprusside should not be taken with Viagra, sildenafil, true or false? And the answer is true because it could lead to a decrease, a fatal decrease in blood pressure. And just a note over here on intercourse after a myocardial infarction, thought this was an opportune time to talk about this. On average, a person should wait four weeks after an MI to re-engage in sexual activity after an MI, of course, depending on symptoms. An inferior MI requires a shorter duration than an anterior MI. Anterior MIs are often worse. Question 95. Easy brooding, bruising, proteinuria, and restrictive cardiomyopathy can be seen in which condition? Amyloidosis. In amyloidosis, this involves deposition of insoluble protein fibrils in various tissues throughout the body. Cardiac involvement is common, especially restrictive cardiomyopathy. And as for the skin, that could lead to easy bruising as amyloid deposits in the skin. And when it deposits in the kidney, that could lead to proteinuria. Question 96. In anaphylactic, anaphylactic shock, PCP... W, sorry, a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is going to be decreased, and that's because arteriolar vasodilation decreases systemic vascular resistance, and venular vasodilation decreases central venous pressure and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as blood is moved forward. Question 97. A 60-year-old woman who had been told several days ago that her husband died has mid-sternal chest pain and nausea. The, Okay, EKG shows T-wave inversions, but no obstructive coronary artery disease. What is the diagnosis? So this is Takotsubu cardiomyopathy. In this condition, there's stress-induced cardiomyopathy. That's what it's also known as, and it's mostly seen in postmenopausal women characterized by left ventricular ballooning. And EKG shows evidence of ischemia, such as ST elevations and T-wave inversions, chest, and the chest pain mimics MI. But we don't see coronary artery obstruction. The treatment is supportive, and it usually revolve, resolves in a few weeks. Question 98. A 12-year-old boy with a history of polyarthritis and febrile illness now presents with mitral regurgitation on echo. What medication should be given? Well, he had an illness and now he has mitral regurgitation. This sounds like, well, we're giving penicillin for rheumatic heart disease, a complication of GAS, group A strep. That's why we give penicillin as prophylaxis to prevent reoccurrence. We also monitor the patient every 6 to 12 months for signs of left ventricular dysfunction. Question 99. Which medication can safely be taken during pregnancy? And this is going to be nifedipine, a calcium channel blocker. The other ones cannot be taken during pregnancy, and you could take a look at why. What's interesting over here is that atenolol can't be taken during pregnancy because it lowers birth weight, birth weight, but other beta blockers can be taken during pregnancy. Question 100. After insufflation of CO2 gas into the abdominal cavity, a patient develops a bradycardia and AV block. What is the mechanism? This is actually due to stretching of the peritoneum. What happens is the CO2 insufflation during laparoscopic surgery, such as appendectomy, stimulates stretch receptors on the peritoneum and the increase in vagal tone, and there's an increase in vagal tone. Patients can therefore develop severe bradycardia, AV block, and sometimes even asystole. Question 101. A 33-year-old woman presents with chest pain for the last four months. The pain is described as a squeezing type that radiates to the neck and can last up to three hours. Blood pressure is 120 over 81. EKG and exercise stress tests are negative. What is the most likely cause of the pain over here? So if EKG and exercise stress tests are negative, we're probably not dealing with a cardiac problem. And also, the dur duration of the pain, three hours, is not typical of cardiac problems. Therefore, it's most likely an esophageal disease that we're dealing with over here, which we explain over here. Angina pain usually lasts a few minutes, whereas esophageal pain lasts can last for up to hours. And another distinguishing, distinguishing feature is that esophageal chest pain comes on with meals or position, whereas angina comes on usually with exertion. Question 104. A 34-year-old woman from a developing country presents with left-sided weakness that started several hours earlier. She has had periods of palpitations and an irregular heartbeat, along with dyspnea, nighttime cough, and hemoptysis. What is the diagnosis? So this is a tough one, but here we're likely dealing with mitral stenosis in the setting of rheumatic heart disease. What happens is that in mitral stenosis due to rheumatic heart disease, there's an increase in left atrial pressure as blood tries to push its way into the left ventricle with difficulty. Now, this left atrium also this predisposes the left atrium, which increases in pressure to atrial fibrillation. And that's likely what happened over here, that she's had this left-sided hemiparesis likely due to the thromboembolic stroke from AFib in the setting of the mitral stenosis.
Question 105. A crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur heard best along the left sternal border in a 25-year-old woman is most likely due to interventricular septal hypertrophy, i.e. hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that produces this crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur. Question 106. Uveitis and complete AV block are seen in sarcoidosis. We see uveitis and cardiac conditions such as AV block. Other things that we see are arrhythmia, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and sudden cardiac death. Question 107. Which of the following conditions is a common cause of dilated cardiomyopathy in young adults? And the answer is virus infection that causes dilated cardiomyopathy. And you could take a look at the pathophysiology over here. And patients with dilated cardiomyopathy present with symptoms of decompensated heart failure, such as dyspnea, orthopnea, and edema. Question 108. What is the most common congenital heart defect in Down syndrome patients? And the answer, answer is actually atrial septal defect, a complete atrial septal defect. So patients may present with heart failure in infancy, a fixed split S2, and a systolic ejection murmur as increased blood flows across the pulmonary valve, again, because blood flows from the left atrium to the right atrium and through the lungs with an increased murmur. PDA is seen in congenital rubella, and coarctation of the aorta is seen in Turner syndrome. Question 109. A patient presents with a blood pressure of 175, 74 over 75. So this is isolated systolic, systolic hypertension. This is most probably caused by decreased compliance of the arterial, arterial walls that explains the isolated systolic hypertension. And uh, we treat this with calcium channel blockers and thiazides. Question 110. Do patients with prosthetic heart valves require antimicrobial prophylaxis against, for example, infective endocarditis before undergoing colonoscopy? And the answer is no. They do not require it because it's only colonoscopy. They would only require prophylaxis for procedures involving the mouth, the respiratory mucosa, infected tissues, and infected areas of the GI or GU tract, but not for most other GI GU procedures, such as colonoscopy. Question 111. A young patient with chronic back pain, intermittent bilateral heel pain, impaired spinal mobility, limited chest expansion, is most likely to have which cardiac defect? So here we're dealing with ankylosing spondylitis, and in ankylosing spondylitis, patients can have aortic regurgitation. Ankylosing spondylitis is an inflammatory arthropathy involving chronic back pain, impaired spinal mobility, and enthesitis. Aortic regurgitation is a complication in 10% of cases of ankylosing spondylitis. The mitral and tricuspid valves are unaffected. It's an aorta problem, not a valve problem, and it may cause conduction abnormalities. It's a, again, it's a problem of, a, of aortic regurgitation. Question 112. Brugada syndrome is due to a structural defect in the heart, and the answer is false. Brugada syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition affecting cardiac sodium channels. Patients have EKG abnormalities, such as ST elevations in leads V1 through V2, but no structural abnormalities. And, and patients may die from ventricular arrhythmia, so they have to have an implantable device. Question 113. Does this EKG indicate a right or left bundle branch block? So here we see kind of like the W-shaped ones in V1 and the M-shaped ones in V6. So W and M would be L, left bundle branch block. This is the mnemonic. We have left William. First there's a W in V1, and then there's like an M in V6. The opposite will be true for, for a right bundle branch block. Question 114. A 43-year-old woman who has smoked for 20 years has nocturnal substernal chest pain ep episodes that last about 10 minutes, and 10 minutes and then resolve. She reports no exertional chest pain or discomfort. This sounds like vasospastic angina. Upon exam, ST elevations are seen during a pain episode. What is the pathophysiology? So this is vasospastic angina, vascular smooth muscle hyperreactivity. This type of angina, also well, previously known as Prinz metal angina, is characterized by, recu by recurrent episodes of chest discomfort resulting from hyperreactivity of vascular smooth muscle leading to intermittent vasospasm of the coronary artery and is typically treated with calcium channel blockers. Question 115. Abrupt onset chest pain and mediastinal whining, as seen in this picture over here, is seen in aortic dissection. There's going to be mediastinal whining, widening as blood fills up that area. Uh, CAT scan is, is usually the diagnostic te test of choice for suspected aortic dissection, and we treat it with beta blockers until surgery may be required. Often, that is the case. And pulmonary embolism, the mediastinum, is enclosed by the pleura. That would not necessarily cause, or wouldn't usually cause, a mediastinal widening.
Question 116. An asymptomatic one-day-old baby shows a pulse ox of 99% in the right hand and 89% in the right foot. Distal pulses are strong. What is that diagnosis? Coarctation or fetal circulation persistence? So over here, we have a difference in the upper and lower extremity in terms of the pulse ox. This can be seen in both of the conditions that we see over here. But the distal pulses are strong. That points to a diagnosis of fetal circulation persistence as opposed to coarctation of the aorta. In fetal circulation persistence, the distal pulses will still be strong. And I explain that over here. Question 117, an unresponsive patient has no palpable pulse. The cardiac monitor still shows atrial fibrillation. What is the next best step? So if he has no pulse, we have to do compressions. Compressions, because PEA, pulseless electrical activity, or asystole, should be man managed with uninterrupted CPR, along with vasopressor therapy if avail available, to maintain cerebral and coronary perfusion. There is no work for defib or cardio version in these cases. Question 118. A two-year-old boy is brought to the ED with fever and respiratory distress. He recovered from a URI with rhinorrhea and congestion about a week ago, but fever and fatigue has pers have persisted. Cardiac exam shows tachycardia and S3 gallop and a house stylic murmur heard best at the cardiac apex. What is the most likely diagnosis? So here we're not dealing with someone who had pharyngitis. That would be acute rheumatic fever. He had a URI and now he has most likely viral myocarditis. Viral myocarditis, there's a viral prodrome in upper URI, then chest pain and respiratory distress from acute heart failure and pulmonary edema, dilated cardiomyopathy with mitral regurgitation cause an S3 gallop and a hollow systolic murmur. As opposed to an acute rheumatic fever, again, the patient probably presents with pharyngitis, not rhinorrhea and congestion, and typically, typically present with fever and arthritis weeks after group A strep infection. Question 119. What is the murmur of mitral regurgitation? When is it louder? During inspiration or expiration? The answer is it's going to be louder during expiration because right you're doing a left-sided murmur. Left-sided murmurs get louder with expiration. That helps us distinguish mitral regurgitation from tricuspid regurgitation. Question 120. A 30-year-old man complaining of headaches has a blood pressure read of 181 over 105. Auscultation reveals a continuous murmur. So he has very high blood pressure, and he has a continuous murmur, which will like what will likely be seen on chest x-ray. It could be that you don't have enough to answer this question, but what's going on over here is he has coarctation of the aorta. He has high blood pressure, and a continuous murmur represents the collateral circulation. And on chest x-ray, we're going to see inferior costal surface erosions. This is due to pressure-induced enlargement of the rib arteries. Question, oh, and we have a picture of coarctation over the aorta over here, where we see high blood pressure at the before the point of the coarctation and low blood pressure beyond the point of the coarctation, such as in the lower extremities. Question 121. A 51-year-old woman woke up an hour ago with severe burning retrosternal chest pain, left arm numbness, along with diaphoresis. So we're dealing with an acute coronary syndrome. Her heart sounds are normal. Troponin levels are normal, so it's not an MI, while EKG shows a normal sinus rhythm with some T-wave inversions. What is the next step? So we want to give heparin. Just like in MI, we want to give heparin. In acute coronary syndrome, such as unstable angina in this case, we want to give heparin, along with dual antiplatelet beta blockers, nitrates as needed, and statins. Exercise EKG, no, that would be for stable angina, and the IV alteplase, that would be for a STEMI, not an a unstable angina or an end STEMI. Question 122, a 57 year old man presents with palpable rocking and clicking of the sternum that has continued after his recent cabbage. What is the next step? And the answer is surgery, because we're dealing with sternal dehiscence, which is a complication of cardiac surgery and require and it requires itself surgery. Question 123, a man falls 20 feet from a building and chest x-ray shows abnormal contour of the aorta and a widened mediastinum. This sounds like he endured injury to the aorta. Blood pressure is normal. What's the diagnosis? It's aortic rupture. Rapid deceleration injuries can cause blunt thoracic aortic injury and the chest x-ray will show widened mediastinum and an abnormal aorta contour and or a left-sided effusion due to a hemothorax. Question 124. Which antihypertensive can cause bilateral ankle swelling? And this is going to be amlodipine causes peripheral edema in 25% of cases and it can be prevented or reduced by the addition, by the addition of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Question 125. In cardiac tamponade, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is increased or decreased? Well, in tamponade, the heart is squashed and cardiac output will be decreased. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be increased. 
the increased pericardial pressure reduces the cardiac output, as we said, and leads to obstructive shock. So the right atrial pressure and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be increased as blood tries to get out of the heart, but it just can't. Question 126. An elderly patient on on digoxin may develop, what's a side effect of digoxin, bradycardia, and AV block, amongst other things, for example, GI symptoms, nausea, lethargy, and fatigue, and chronic toxicity can lead to neurologic visual and cardiac symptoms. Question 127. A man with a history of anxiety presents with the following EKG. What should be given? Lorazepam or adenosine? So over here, we want to give adenosine because over here, we're dealing with a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. Not lorazepam. That would be for panic attacks. But that would have normal P morphology. If you, as you can see in the picture over here, there was not normal P morphology. We were dealing with a, a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. And for that, we give adenosine. Question 128, what is the treatment for post-cardiac injury syndrome? So here, we want to give an NSAID, main one being aspirin. Post-cardiac injury syndrome is an immune-mediated pericarditis that can occur from weeks to months after an MI, and aspirin is usually given. Antibiotics would be for bacterial pericarditis, which is very rare. Question 129, patients with prior MI complicated by left ventricular systolic dysfunction with an EF below 30% are at increase of sudden de- cardiac death due to, the answer is, ventricular arrhythmia. We try to provide medical therapy for, to prevent this, but if the patient fails, despite three months of optimal medical therapy, we, uh, we prevent with placement of an ICD. Question 130. Sometime after a cardiac cath procedure, a patient develops localized pain and swelling by his inguinal area. A continuous brood is heard with a palpable thrill over the site. What is the diagnosis? So the palpable thrill, that's an AV fistula. And this can happen with cardiac cath procedures as blood flows from the artery through into the vein and it creates an AV fistula. Patients may be asymptomatic at first, but it, and it's diagnosed with ultrasound, and large ones may require surgical repair. Question 131, which of the following complications of aortic dissection can lead to heart failure and death? And it's aortic, acute aortic regurgitation. Let's explain what happens. In acute aortic regurgitation, what happens is the, reason, the way it was caused, the extension of the type A aortic dissection goes into the aortic valve annulus, causing acute regurgitation and heart failure. Question 132, a woman is found with pulseless electrical activity after on hospital day six after enduring a lateral wall STEMI. After initiation of ACLS protocol, what's the next best step? Reassurance of pericarditis and its pericarditis since she endured this lateral wall STM EMI and then went into PEA, pulse electrical activity, she likely had free wall rupture and therefore we have to get rid of the pericardial fluid. Question 133, when is central venous pressure elevated, in hypovolemic or in cardiogenic shock? And the answer is in cardiogenic shock. That's how we, one of the ways that we distinguish between the two. An example would be in acute heart dysfunction after blunt cardiac injury, we have cardiogenic shock and central venous pressure will be elevated. Question 134, a patient with untreated hyperthyroidism has new onset fever and tachycardia with blood pressure 180 over 105. This sounds like a possibly a thyroid storm. What cardiac hemodynamics will be seen in cardiac storm? There will be increased cardiac output and decreased systemic vascular resistance. Thyroid storm, for example, with these conditions, leads to reduced systemic vascular resistance due to direct vasodilation and a reflexive increase in cardiac contractility leading to increased cardiac output. Question 135. How does squatting improve cyanosis in tetralogy of Fallot and it leads to decreased right to left shunting? What happens is that the squatting increases the afterload by squashing the veins and this leads to increased blood flow across the right ventricle outflow obstruction, improving the cyanosis. Again, more blood is able to now make its way to the lungs, and that improves the cyanosis. And here we see a picture of Tetralogy of Philo. A patient develops the following cutaneous findings after a cardiac cath procedure. What is the diagnosis? So this is classic of cholesterol embolism, and this occurs when an atherosclerotic plaque is dislodged and flows into the circulation, and this leads to the partial or total occlusion of arterioles, leading to tissue or organ ischemia, and that's what we saw in the picture. And the treatment is supportive, and statin therapy can prevent reoccurrence. Question 137, what is the cause of this EKG over here? Here we see the delta wave, and this is an accessory AV pathway in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. It's uh, due to an accessory AV pathway. Patients are susceptible to developing paroxysmal tachyarrhythmias.
Question 138. A cyanotic newborn's EKG shows tall P waves and left axis deviation. There are decreased pulmonary markings on chest x-ray. What is the diagnosis? So these are features of tricuspid valve atresia. In tricuspid valve atresia, that's when there's no tricuspid valve. So what happens is atrial septal defect is necessary for survival of these patients. Blood flows from the right atrium to the left atrium and then through a ventricular septal defect to the lungs. That explains the hollow systolic murmur. 139, amiodarone causes either hypo or hyperthyroidism. Tri question 140, tricuspid regurgitation murmur undergoes what change during inspiration? As we mentioned, right-sided murmurs are going to increase with inspiration. Question 141, how is blunt thoracic aortic injury diagnosed with transthoracic echo or CT angiography? And it is CT angiography. That's how we diagnose blunt thoracic aortic injury. And what we get is in a blunt thoracic aortic injury, we get a pseudo coarctation. And that's what we see on the CT angiography. There's upper extremity hypertension and lower extremity hypotension. And a patient may present with a hoarse voice due to this uh, blunt, th blunt injury. Question 142. A boxer has a brief loss of consciousness after standing up. Upon evaluation, he has dry mucous membranes, an elevated view on creatinine ratio, and hypokalemia. What is the source of the syncope? This is due to hypotension, orthostatic hypotension. Most likely, for example, in a boxer, due to orthostatic hypotension and due to hypovolemia, because he may have fluid restriction and diuretic use, which is common in athletes. That explains the dry mucous membranes and the elevated BUN. Hypokalemia could be due to diuretic potassium wasting effects. Question 143, BNP levels correlate with the severity of, this is going to be the left ventricular systolic dysfunction. BNP is a hormone released from ventricular myocytes in response to high ventricular filling pressures and wall stress, and it's generally high in patients with chronic heart failure. And it's unknown why it's low in obesity, but it's actually falsely low in obesity. Question 144, amiodarone does what to digoxin? Does to levels of digoxin? It increases serum levels of digoxin. That's why you have to be careful. In patient taking digoxin, we'd start taking amiodarone. Question 145, the acute management of STEMI involves what? Cardiac cath. I guess I didn't go too much into that, but acute management of STEMI involves cardiac catheterization. Question 146, a 35-year-old woman with blood pressure of 155 over 80, progressive shortness of breath, peripheral edema, basilar lung crackles, along with recent weight loss and palpitations is consistent with, this is high output heart failure. In high output heart failure, there's going to be a decreased systemic vascular resistance as blood moves forward, but the left ventricle can't keep up with the increase in venous return, and that's why there's going to be peripheral edema. An example of something that could cause this is, uh, is hyperthyroidism. That's a common cause of high output cardiac failure. Question 147, surgical indication for infective endocarditis includes all of the above, acute heart failure, abscess, an organism that is difficult to eradicate, and a large vegetation. These are all indications for infective carditis surgery that a person's patient should have the valve surgically corrected. Question 148, a patient has persistent tachyarrhythmia causing hemodynamic instability. What is the next step? There's cardioversion because it's causing instability, right? Amiodarone would be for uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia where the patient is stable. Question 149, a patient with chest pain associated with an NSEMI would benefit from P2Y12 inhibitor. Ibuprofen and colchicine is for pericarditis, but in a um, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, dual, that is, dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin and a P2Y12 would be the dual antiplatelet therapy, and this lowers morbidity and mortality rates in and STEMI. Question 150. In a patient with an AV fistula, in preparation, for example, for hemodialysis, cardiac preload will be increased because the AV fistula allows more blood to return to the heart. This can e even lead to a high output heart failure, so keep an eye on that AV fistula. Question 151. A patient with resistant hypertension and diffuse atherosclerosis most likely has this is going to be renovascular hypertension. Renovascular hypertension should be suspected in any patient with resistant hypertension and diffuse atherosclerosis. We, almost, we may also see asymmetric kidney size and pulmonary edema, and a continuous abdominal brute has high specificity for renovascular hypertension. I'm sorry for the typos on this page. Question 152. A patient with epigastric pain and nausea along with hypotension and bradycardia has an EKG with T-wave inversion in 2-3 and AVF. 
What is the next step? So over here, we have an inferior MI, and in an inferior MI, we want to get a right-sided precordial EKG because it likely affects the right ventricle. In lots of cases of an inferior MI, the right ventricle is also affected. We want to check out that right ventricular involvement, and an SD elevation of VR, v, V4R is highly accurate in confirming right ventricular myocardial infarction. Question 153, a patient develops hypotension and has increased JVD a day after undergoing a cabbage surgery. So he has a pericardial effusion. What's the next step? We want to get an echo. He has post-operative cardiac tamponade. Urgent echo should be done for diagnosis and guide management. Question 154, an antiarrhythmic is prescribed for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. The patient undergoes a treadmill exercise test and is noted that as, as heart rate goes up, the QRX complexes widen. What was prescribed, this is flocainide, because what we're dealing with over here is use dependence, a progressive increase in sodium channel inhibition with faster heart rates, leading to an increase in QRX complex duration. So basically, they have higher effect with higher heart rates. Question 155. Several days after a valve replacement, a patient develops fever, tachycardia, chest pain, and sternal wound purulent discharge. What is the next step? So surgery, because here we're dealing with acute mediastinitis, a possible complication of cardiac surgery. Patients present with fever, chest pain, and discharge. And again, treatment is drainage, surgical debridement, and prolonged antibiotics. Question 156. Cardiac monitoring immediately preceding vasovagal syncope shows bradycardia. That's what we see. We don't see tachy, we see bradycardia. And we explain that over here. It generally resolves within a minute as cerebral perfusion is restored. Question 157. A newborn has central cyanosis but normal blood, blood pressure in all extremities. A harsh crescendo-decrescendo systolic murmur is heard over the left upper sternal border. What is the diagnosis? Over here we have tetralogy of Fallot. Let's explain. The murmur reflects the pulmonary artery stenosis. In tetralogy flow, there's pulmonary artery stenosis, and that explains the harsh crescendo, decrescendo systolic murmur. Question 158, a man develops a moderate pleural effusion two days after a cabbage surgery. The patient has no respiratory symptoms. What is the next step? Thoracocentesis or observation? The answer is observation, because moderate pleural effusions after cabbages are normal and normally go away on their own. Question 159, the murmur of a hypotrophic cardiomyopathy increases with, well, it's going to increase in things that decrease blood volume in the left ventricle, Valsalva, all right? But squatting is going to increase blood volume, squatting is going to increase the volume there, and that would decrease the murmur. Question 160, small ventricular septal defects in newborns are typically hemodynamically insignificant and close spontane spontaneously by age two. That's true. Question 161, a 75-year-old obese man has dry, scaly, and itchy skin over his legs. They appear brown and woody with ulceration and swollen with ulceration and are swollen. How is the diagnosis of this condition confirmed? So that's venous Doppler ultrasound, because what we're dealing with over here is venous stasis. This is common in patients who are older and obese and who have a history of venous thrombosis. And this is confirmed with venous Doppler ultrasound. A um that's where they have fibrosis and woody induration, as we mentioned. Question 162. What is the pathophysiology of fibromuscular dysplasia? This is going to be abnormal cell development in the arterial wall. Uh, it's an idiopathic non-inflammatory condition that mainly affects young women, women and involves abnormal, abnormal cell development in the arterial wall. It primarily involves re the renal arteries, leading to hypertension, cerebral arteries, leading to brain ischemia, uh, the, and these conditions over here. Question 163, a biphasic strider in a baby that improves with neck extension represents, is that aspiration of a foreign body or airway compression by a vascular ring? This is airway compression by a vascular ring. The aspiration of a foreign body, it would cause strider, but the baby would be look like he's dying. And in the lower airway, it wouldn't cause any strider. Airway compression by a vascular ring, however, would cause a biphasic strider, both during inspiration and during expiration, and it would improve with neck extension. Question 164. A pregnant woman from a developing country with a history of recurrent sore throat now develops, at 30 weeks gestation, sudden onset cough, progressive dyspnea, and orthopnea. What is the diagnosis? So it looks like she has pulmonary edema, and that can be caused by mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis can cause uh, pulmonary edema, especially when there's AFib involved, that would increase the pulmonary edema due to the backup of fluid to the lungs.
So again, we're dealing with the rheumatic condition over here with pulmonary edema. Question 165. Five days after an anterior wall MI, a patient develops sudden onset chest pain. He becomes agitated and soon becomes unresponsive with no palpable pulse. With no pulse, what is the diagnosis? As we saw before, this is free wall rupture. Question 166. What is the most effective way to minimize triple A progression, abdominal aortic aneurysm? And the answer is to quit smoking. That's even better than hypertension reduction at least systolic hypertension reduction. Question 167. A 45-year-old woman who has an episode of syncope. EKG shows sinus rhythm, prolonged PR interval, prolonged QRS complexes, occasional PVCs, and an EF of 60%. What is the cause of her syncope? There's going to be bradyarrhythmias. PVCs generally don't cause syncope. Right? Bradyarrhythmias suggested by the prolonged PR interval and an IV conduction delay. Quite so all patients with unexplained syncope should get an EKG. Findings which should, should suggest an arrhythmia as the cause include bradycardia, sinus pauses, AV block, and prolonged QT. Question 168. Besides pain medication, what medication is given as initial therapy for aortic dissection? It is a beta blocker. That's what we get for aortic dissection. Question 169. A patient presents with palpitations, and this is her EKG. What's the pathophysiology? So this is not a fib. This is a narrow, a narrow complex tachycardia, the most common one being AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which involves two distinct conduction pathways in the AV node. And we end this with adenosine. Catheter ablation may be considered as long-term therapy. By the way, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia would be an example. Question 170. A patient with an inferior MI, inferior wall MI, now has hypotension. What is the cause? Again, it affects the right ventricle, decreased right ventricular contractility. Question 171. What is the treatment for monomorphic ventricular tachycardia in a stable patient? We've mentioned this before. Amy Oderone. Question 172. A patient underwent femoral embolectomy and now has swelling of the right calf with paresthesia along with severe pain that is worse with passive range of motion. Um, well, we're going to get to it. This is compartment syndrome where we sometimes do have pulses, but there's going to be pain with passive range of motion. Okay, The treatment is emergency fasciotomy. Question 173. In septic shock, mixed venous oxygen saturation is going to be increased. Septic shock leads to decreased SVR due to peripheral vasodilation. Initially, cardiac output is increased in an attempt to maintain peripheral tissue perfusion, leading to elevated mix of venous oxygen saturation, since the tissues can't extract oxygen quickly enough as blood flows through the capillaries. In late septic shock, cardiac output decreases as the heart is severely damaged, or as myocardial contractile dysfunction develops. Question 174. A patient has a procedure in which a pacemaker is implanted and now has signs of heart failure. A hollow systolic murmur is best heard at the left sternal border. What is this? This is tricuspid regurgitation, which is a complication of pacemaker placement. Question 175. A 67-year-old lady has an episode of syncope. This is what her EKG looks like. What is the next step? So here we have bradycardia, and we treat that with atropine. Question 176. A 20-hour-old girl is evaluated for worsening cyanosis and rapid breathing. Pulse ox is 79%, which does not prove improve with pure oxygen. She is hypotensive and tachycardic, but no murmurs are present and breath sounds are normal. Echo is petting, pending. What is the next best step? So here we want to give prostaglandin E1, because here we're dealing with a situation of a ductal dependent congenital heart defect where we want to keep the ductus arteriosus open. That's why this 20 hour old baby has this worsening cyanosis because the ductus arteriosus is closing. We want to keep it open. We want to maintain patency. For example, in coarctation of the aorta. Question 177. A 64 year old man with substernal chest pain is found to have decompensated heart failure. Blood pressure is 108 over 71. And S3 is heard on exam as well as by basilar crackles halfway up the lung fields. So he has the, all this edema building up. He's given aspirin, clopidogrel, statin, and anticoagulation. What else should be given? We want to give furosemide. We're dealing with decompensated heart failure. We want to remove the fluid. Not metoprolol. We do not give that in decompensated heart failure. Question 178, the most common cause of the most common peripheral artery aneurysms are the palpiteal and femoral artery. They can cause aneurysms and they're they are associated with abdominal aortic aneurysm. Question 179, a patient with a history of a radiation therapy now experiences peripheral edema ascites along with dyspnea and exertion, JVP is elevated. What is the source? So here we're dealing with constrictive pericarditis, which is a complication of radiation therapy to the mediastinum. Question 180, a baby born several hours ago presents with cyanosis since birth tachypnea, a normal S1, and a single out S2. Pure oxygen does not improve the cyanosis, so we're dealing with a structural heart defect over here. What is the diagnosis? The transposition of the great arteries, where the aorta and the pulmonary artery are, are switched. Question 181. All patients aged above 40 with 
diabetes mellitus should start lipid lowering therapy with a statin regardless of baseline lipid therapies and that is true and if under 40 they should take a statin with additional cardiac cardiovascular risk factors question 182 a complication of infective carditis is acute mitral regurgitation that is definitely true a patient experiences syncope here's the akg what is the treatment for syncope in this situation where we see electrical arthritis? this is pericardiosynthesis how is alcoholic cardiomyopathy diagnosed? We do it. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. When we see that there are no other causes, we see it's alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Question 185. The baby is born with a ventricular septal defect. What is occurring inside the baby's heart? Inside of, There's going to be increased left atrial preload. That's what's going on in ventricular septal defect. Increased left atrial preload as blood flows from the left side of the heart to the right, and there's going to be increased left atrial preload. Question 186, a newborn of a diabetic mother has respiratory distress with a systolic murmur and a thickened IV septum. What will most likely eventually occur? Again, this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This will spontaneously resolve on its own. Question 187, joint laxity, poor wound healing, and skin hyperextensibility in a normal patient is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. What is the treatment for congenital long QT syndrome? Congenital long QT syndrome is treated with propanolol. Question 189, what class of medications does not improve mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction calcium channel blockers? All these other medications does improve mortality in patients with heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction. Question 190, a patient has an elevated BUN along with pleuritic chest pain and a friction rub. This is pericarditis. Question 191, which of the following has a cardiovascular benefit for patients with hypotrichosidemia already taking a statin? Reduce alcohol intake, adding a fibrate doesn't help. Question 192, syncope that occurs suddenly is most likely due to cardiac or neurologic cause. If it was a toxin or metabolic problem, it would be usually gradual. Question 193, syncope due to ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation in man from Asia with a right bundle branch broch, or bundle branch brock, c 9 kg is treated with AICD placement. This is Brugada syndrome. Question 194, a 55-year-old woman develops chest pain, dyspnea, and SD elevations in V2, V4 after hearing her son died. This is what we said before, uh, takotsobu cardiomyopathy, and it's due to a catecholamine release. And again, as we said before, revascularization doesn't help since the coronary arteries are not involved. Question 195, a 74-year-old man comes in for a five-month uh, uh, follow-up after an uneventful cardiac bypass surgery. Physical exam is normal except an irregular pulse. Here we see a flutter. What's the next best step? Begin an oral anticoagulant because just like an AFib, just like an AFib, atrial flutter carries a risk of arterial thromboembolism and should therefore be managed with chronic anticoagulation. Question 196. Which lipid lowering medication can lead to gout? Niacin because it could lead to elevations of glucose and uric acid as well as pruritus and you can look at the other choices to see what adverse effects they have. For example, statins can lead to an STALT elevation. Question 197, a 67-year-old woman comes to the ED with crushing chest pain. Which of the following ECG findings indicates the worst prognosis? An anterior wall, myocardial infarction, that's choice B. Question 198, in decompensated heart failure, pulmonary edema is always present, that is false, in the early stages it is not present, all right? Question 199, a 69-year-old woman comes to the ED with acute onset shortness of breath, respiratory rate is 39, rails, S3 gallop, and JVD. So we have pulmonary edema. What is the best first step? So this is chronic heart failure with a pulmonary edema. We want to give IV furosemide. Metoprolol could be given, but not when there's this pulmonary edema. We first want to get rid of the fluids, and the echo should be done later. Question 200, what is the most common cause of death from congestive heart failure, as we said before, in arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia, and that's why we said beta blockers are so important to get that rate control.